Lecture 36, Evangelism, Part 1. You'll remember we're talking now about the Holy Spirit and have indicated that his major role is in evangelism in the history of redemption. So we take up this topic now in pursuant of that theme. Number one, evangelism is the human means by which God brings men out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1.13. Two, the human instruments are primarily divinely called teachers and preachers who declare the whole counsel of God, Acts 20.27. Three, if they do not understand that regeneration precedes faith, they are not fit to be teachers and preachers of the word, John 3.10. Four, when the word goes forth, it will not return to God void, but will accomplish that for which it is sent, to hide from some and reveal to others. Luke 10, 21. Five, the evangelist is successful, therefore, who blinds as well as illumines, though he aims at illumination. Six, the natural tendency of the hearers of the preached word is to disbelieve, not because what they hear is untrue, but because they do not like what they hear. They will not have God in their thinking, and the Bible is God's Word. So they will not have the Bible in their thinking, even if they are skilled, unregenerate teachers of the Bible. They may be thinking about the Bible all the time, who will not have the Bible in their thinking. Seven, but the unbeliever has a problem. He would not have God in his thinking, but when he hears the word, he understands it, doesn't like it, but cannot deny its truth. He dimly fears, number nine, that there is something wrong with him and not the Bible whose doctrine he may mock. Ten. As a scholar once said to me about the biblical doctrine of original sin, which I was defending, I don't know where you're wrong, Gerstner, but I hope to God you are. Now let's look at this more closely. Number one, evangelism is the human means by which God brings men out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1.13. Remember, we've been discussing in some detail man the sinner. We fell in Adam and we have been falling ever since. We do evil greedily. We become more and more wicked all the time. There is everlastingly room for deprovement as we have seen. Now, how is a person like that, a lover of the darkness, digging deeper and deeper into the pit, how is he ever going to be lifted up and translated into a sphere of light, brilliant, divine illumination? It's going to be by evangelism. That's the divinely appointed device for extricating sinners from their ruin and translating them into everlasting life. Number two, the human instruments are primarily divinely called teachers and preachers who declare the whole counsel of God. That Acts 20:27 20, passage is where the greatest preacher of all time, the Apostle Paul, is indicating that he did not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God. You might wonder why the Apostle to the Gentiles in the world 
would have ever been tempted to shrink from the gospel he loved so much and preached with such utmost fidelity. No doubt he shrank, not because he didn't love the doctrine, but because he sensed those to whom he preached it wouldn't. We've met that episode in the Gospels where when Jesus was talking about the decrees of God and about the way of salvation in divine sovereignty, a goodly number of professed believers left him. Remember how he turned to Peter and said, will you leave me too? And Peter's only answer was, Lord, to whom else can we go? It wasn't as if he hadn't thought of it. It wasn't as if he didn't find this whole counsel of God a difficult thing to accept. He was staying with Christ because he knew there was no place else to go. Christ was the teacher of the whole council, then he had to accept the whole council of God because there is no alternative. No doubt it's because of people's antipathy to the whole council of God that Paul was tempted to shrink and made it a point by the movement of the Holy Spirit to tell us that he did not do so. And I remind you that in the case of Peter, uh, the shrinking was by those who actually professed to be believers. It's not merely that the outside world would find these doctrines repugnant, but those who profess to believe Jesus Christ found them more than they could take, more than they would bear. In other words, the evangelist preaching the whole gospel of Jesus Christ has to be alert to the fact that he is very likely not only to alienate the world, but alienate many in the church who profess to believe these things. Number three, if they do not understand, these preachers of the whole counsel of God, if they do not understand that regeneration precedes faith, that's a part of the whole counsel, they are not fit to be teachers and preachers of the Word, John 3.10. I've mentioned this before in another connection. I may here add, uh, for what it's worth, the fact that my own conversion to a true ministry occurred at this particular point, my second year in college. When I was converted, it was upon hearing the basic rudiments of the gospel story. I can still remember a man telling me in about a half an hour something that I hadn't quite heard or at least understood when I sat in the pew in a Christian church. I will not say my pastor wasn't saying it. He wasn't saying it the same way. I wasn't paying close attention. At least I didn't get it until I heard this particular individual. Trace the crimson flow, as he called it, of the blood of Jesus Christ through the whole Bible. And my heart was just changed on the spot. I was utterly fascinated and transfixed by the story, and Jesus Christ was for me. And the only question I had in my mind was how would I serve him? That was the only question. Now, for two years, and they were the first two years in college, I lived under the notion and the conviction that the faith I had, I had myself produced. I was aware of the fact that indeed it was my faith. I was exercising it, but I was also assuming 
that because I almost felt the faith being born upon hearing that story two years earlier about Jesus and his love that John Gerstner had given that reaction to the gospel, that this was my faith not only in exercise, but in origin. It was while I was listening to some lectures on theology that the professor uttered these three words. Regeneration, you know that means simply being born again. Regeneration precedes faith. I was sitting, as I usually do, in the last row in the class. I'm a backbencher by nature, but I literally jumped out of my seat. I raised my hand because I was sure the professor didn't mean to say that. And I said, Dr. Orr, will you kindly repeat that last statement? And he, with a twinkle in his eye, because he knew what had hit me, though I didn't. He just simply said once again, regeneration precedes faith. Well, I I was sure he didn't mean that. I was sure it was a, you know, slip of the tongue, an unconscious uh, juxtaposition. I knew he meant, of course, faith precedes regeneration, and he just didn't know that that wasn't what he was saying. So I I said, Dr. Orr, you don't mean that, do you? You do mean that faith precedes regeneration. He knew I wasn't being rude. I was just being stupid, that was all. He understood that. I didn't. He just smiled. And he said, no, (laughs) regeneration precedes faith. So for the next three weeks, that's all I could think about. I read the Bible, and I prayed, and I read the theologians, and I prayed, and I read the Bible, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I read, and I prayed, and I thought about this that I just couldn't imagine could be the case. I don't know whether I'd have been able even to think about it any longer if it hadn't come from the lips of a man I greatly admired and whose biblical knowledge I felt was superb. I knew there had to be something to it, though I couldn't for the life of me believe it was so at the beginning, but by three weeks of living with this thing day in and day out, I became persuaded that that indeed was the truth of God, that that's precisely what Christ was telling Nicodemus. And when he says in John 3.10, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand that regeneration precedes faith? Jesus Christ meant that if you don't understand what that teacher of the word, John Orr, was saying to me that regeneration precedes faith, you ought not to be a teacher of the word. You ought not to be a preacher. I was in training to be a preacher. And I realized that I was not fit to be a preacher until this particular truth, which I thought was manifest error, was the very truth of God, a part indeed of the whole counsel of God. Well, that's my personal experience, which isn't significant in itself. I only relate it because it has to be your experience too if you're going to be an evangelist. This is a part of the whole counsel of God. And well, we don't have to go into detail right now to see that it makes all the difference in the world whether you think that regeneration precedes faith or faith precedes regeneration. Wouldn't make any difference whether you did or not if Jesus Christ once said, are you a teacher of Israel and don't understand this? 
You know full well you ought not to be a teacher of Israel, but I'm saying you can also understand where our Lord would say such a thing as that because this view of Christian redemption is catastrophically different from the other view, which is, you must surely know, the prevailing one, that is, the reverse of that, the idea under which Nicodemus was laboring at the time. Number four. Let me say, I have this one sentence here, you know. It's a course in theology. And sometimes people be, think because theology is such a scientific aspect of Christianity isn't quite so vital. But you're realizing now this particular theological point is absolutely indispensable to, be, to being a teacher of the Word. You don't have a right to instruct Israel to be a teacher in the church unless you have this theological datum correct. Unless you understand it and believe it and proclaim it, you ought not to be in a pulpit or behind a teaching desk or giving videotapes or audio tapes or anything else on the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how practical sound theology, the whole counsel of God, sound theology is. Number four, when the word goes forth, it will not return to God void, but will accomplish that for which it is sent to hide from some and reveal to others, Luke 10, 21. The evangelist is successful, therefore, who blinds as well as illumines, though he aims at illumination. He invariably determines his success by the number of people who agree with what he's saying, who, if they're unconverted, adopt the truths they had not previously believed. When evangelists keep records, give invitations, have people respond visibly by a raising of hand or going down an aisle or meeting with a group afterward or whatever device they may have for uh, registering and making statistical data about the responses, they invariably count only those which are favorable ones. That's understandable because you're preaching Christ for people to believe Him and be saved by him, but at the same time, though you're not aiming at this, you're not trying to see how many non-converts you make, and you're not priding yourself on the number of people who are worse after listening to you than they were before, but at the same time, they are going to be worse for having heard you. The very purity of your gospel leading to their hostility and rejection is going to make them much more wicked than they were before they attended your service. And that's a part of your ministry. God intends to hide this from some and reveal it to others as we have seen to be the case. I, I, I can't let this go quite, you know. I, it's not just a matter of reminding you of this because people are so prone to forget it because it's an unpopular, non-registered statistic. As I say, deemed by some people a mark of lack of success, but because you have to realize every time you open your mouth, about the Lord Jesus Christ, you are actually going to harden people or else be the instrument of their salvation. Nobody is going to remain significantly unchanged after they have listened to you preach the gospel. And since this is not an unanticipated response, since we know this is a part of the decrees of God, we say with Jesus Christ, we thank the Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that it is so, not only for those persons who have said, I believe, but for those persons who go away mocking the message as well. You've been used in their life, and they'll be 
stars in your crown for those who have perished under your preaching. See, I say this because it's hard for us to realize that we are being faithful when we are actually alien. We're not aiming at it, but it's going to be there, and we are not going to be ashamed of it. We are going to recognize that is truly a carrying out a will of God just as much as the conversion of the souls in whose experience we rejoice so easily and gladly. Number six, the natural tendency of the hearers of the preached word is to disbelieve, not because what they hear is untrue, but because they do not like what they hear. We've gone through this, you know, in considerable detail, how absolutely fallen people are, so you know full well they're not going to like a message of life when they are dead. You know, you, you have to be constantly surprised when people are converted, when they do come. And if I may tuck in this uh, little note here, you should almost be suspicious. Remember now, when you work with a person for Jesus Christ, you should expect failure. Their natural reaction is going to be negative. They're going to want you to get lost. And if they have it in their power, they'll nail you to a cross, just as they did the Lord. That's what you should expect. Unless there's a change in them, that's the effect of what you're going to say. So whenever you see something other than that, you should be very pleasantly surprised and even a little suspicious. That is not the natural reaction. And when people look as if they are believing... You want to be very careful to see whether they really understand the message. I've been asked more than once what I think about altar calls. Well, this might be a good place in which to get into the meaning of this thing. I don't think there's anything sinful in an altar call. I'm engaging in it all the time in the sense that I'm urging people to turn from their sins and to come to Jesus Christ. There's an invisible altar there. there. You're asked to come to Jesus Christ, whether you come down an aisle or you do it in the privacy of your own home. But come, come, come is the message of the evangelist. But what about the public service where a direct invitation is given and people are asked to, say, come down an aisle or something like that? That's what people mean when they ask me, what do I think about an altar call? Well, the thing that's good about it is, of course, it's a visibilization of the desire of the evangelist for the conversion of people. And it drives home the necessity for people to make a decision. There are many good things that you could say about the altar call. The danger in it, of course, is this, that the person doesn't know what he's doing when he comes down this aisle necessarily. Now, he may be very well informed, but he is never going to be that well informed by a half an hour address, for example, that he would know what accepting Jesus Christ really means. And you wouldn't want to encourage people to think they believe in Jesus Christ and to the salvation of their souls when they don't have enough understanding of what counting the cost means, taking up the cross and following him daily, and so on. You wouldn't want people to think they're believers when they're not believers. That's extremely dangerous. You remember how our Lord said that a preacher is like a sower of seed, and some of that seed falls on shallow ground and It springs up immediately, but as soon as the sun comes out, it withers because it has no root. When he interprets that for us, he says, that represents the person who, when he first hears the gospel, oh, how gladly, with joy, says Jesus, he receives it. 
Now, you know that person, if he were invited at that time or she to come down an aisle, he would come running. He's receiving the gospel with joy. That's the way Jesus actually puts it. But as soon as the sun beats down, as soon as the tribulation comes, as soon as the cost of discipleship registers with him, oh, is that what believing Jesus Christ means? I'm not interested in that at all. He curls up and dies. That which looks like real faith and Christ even describes as receiving him with joy is no receiving him at all. It's receiving a misapprehension of him. It's receiving something, not necessarily the evangelist's fault. It's, he's understood something of what the evangelist said, but as I say, in a half an hour, you can't produce a handout theology or a speak-out theology, and a man may assume that's all there is to it saying, I believe, Lord, and walking down that aisle, he's out of the danger of hell forever, and he's on his way to heaven. Now, it isn't that simple. People, uh, the gospel's simple, but the understanding its meaning and its relationships and so on is not simple. So I would say with respect to altar calls, the idea is good. We should be after the souls of men all the time, reminding them of the necessity of a decision. But the important thing is, Jesus insists that you must count the cost. I'm taking too much time on this, but let me take a, a, a couple minutes more on that since I mentioned our Lord. Our Lord was almost hard-boiled on this point. You remember a young man comes to him. The only thing is he wants a little more time. Bury his parents. Let the dead bury the dead. Boy, that's hard. Here's a Syrophoenician woman. She wants Christ. Christ didn't come for the Gentiles. The bread which is prepared for the children is not meant for dogs. You'd think Jesus had written, had read a book on how not to win people. How could he be more offensive than that? That Nicodemus to whom we referred more than one, he was a big shot. He was the teacher of Israel. He may very well have been one of the most prominent members of the ruling body of Israel. He pays this upstart, Jesus Christ, the compliment of coming to him. He comes by night. He's undoubtedly embarrassed. He hopes no one sees him, but at least he comes. Now, any Madison Avenue specialist would say, look, Jesus, you've got a big man here. The very fact that he's asking you, he'd mean more than a thousand other Israelites. Play your cards carefully. Cultivate this man. Don't let him get away. Don't, of all things, say, you must be born again. Don't alienate the guy. It looks as if Jesus is trying to be offensive. We have this time and time again. Here's this rich young ruler, obviously ready to follow him. He asked him the one thing that the man can't bear. Oh, if he'd, if he'd only have asked him for half of his fortune, or maybe the equivalent of $100,000, not every last cent. But you see what our Lord's doing? He's out for souls, but he's making it perfectly clear what coming to him means, and that's what we as evangelists much do, and we'll continue the story in the next half hour.